All right. Well, good morning, B-Sides. I am extremely excited to be here again speaking at B-Sides San Antonio. Uh, always a very great conference, lots of diversity in everybody that's here, and everybody's always hungry to learn. So I'm really, really excited to teach you all about certificates today. So how to make a certificate. That's what this talk is about. And the good news is it's extremely simple. There's basically just three steps. First, you make a private key, you make a CSR, and you get a certificate authority to sign it. And that's just pretty much it. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Can you expand a little bit on what happens in steps one and two? Okay, expand a little bit on steps one and two. Yeah, I can do, I can do it. So I realize it's about like trying to teach you how to draw an owl like this. So maybe we need to get a little bit further in the weeds. So certificates are basically just a way to cryptographically bind an identity to a cryptographic key. So you take uh, an ID, a key, and you bind them together. The ID can be anything from an email address, a website, uh, a person's company ID, a service account that's executing some type of workload in a system, or even a, a set of permissions on a cloud API uh, using something called Spiffy, which is uh, one of the newer protocols for, for running workload with certificates. Certificates help us all the time in our digital interactions. So you probably used one this morning as you pulled up the QR code to, to get into the registration here today. Your email was going into uh, TLS and using the certificates for that. Just a little more. But how do we trust this, uh, the binding between the certificate and the key? Well, that's what certificate authorities are for. So certificate authorities, they are uh, embedded into browsers and operating systems, and they're the root of trust for this binding of the ID to the key. Uh, certificate authorities have a very specific set of rules that they have to follow, and those are all laid down by the trust store operators that manage all of the certificate authorities that are embedded inside of your browser and operating system. And all of the CAs, because of those rules they have to follow, they're audited and they're held to a very high standard to make sure that they're following all of these rules. There's a, there's a whole document that's put together and managed through something called the CA Browser Forum, and it's a, a place where certificate authorities and the trust store operators can get together and work on how to agree on when to move the different rules and regulations forward and agree on when everybody has to participate and be hold to those set of rules. And it includes things like how the certificate authority would validate the ID that's in there, how it has to keep certain operational or uptime requirements and everything that it has to put into the certificate itself. But there's a whole lot more behind what goes into a certificate than most people see. There's a whole ecosystem behind the certificate authority that's obfuscated from not only the people using certificates in the browsers and connecting to things over the internet, but it's also kind of obfuscated from the people that are giving the certificates, running websites. Who here has ever put a certificate on a website? Either for work or personal, it's lots of people in here. There's a whole lot more that you probably haven't really been involved with behind the scenes getting a certificate authority, especially a, a public certificate authority to get everything that it needs to put everything into the certificates themselves. So. Welcome to the In the Weeds track, and we're going to dive down and get all the way down to the, the root of certificates. So to start, we're going to need a private key. Right now, there's just two types. You have elliptic curve, digital signature algorithm, and an RSA key. And those are the only two that are allowed out on the public web right now to, to be signed by these trusted certificate authorities. Now. 
RSA is the easiest to explain. It's just two big prime numbers. ACDSA is based on elliptic curve cryptography, and it is way, way harder to explain, but making the private key is way easier. All you need is a big random number, and that's your private key for an elliptic curve. So elliptic curves are basically just uh, lines on a graph, but because computers are finite and you only have so much room in the computer register, they kind of wrap themselves around the graph and you have to have discrete points. But like I said, it's way harder to explain those than uh, just multiplying two primes together. It's a whole other talk in and of itself. So the goal, we had to bind an identity to a key and we got our key now, right? So we bind these two together and share it to the world. But this is private, so we can't do that. Luckily, there's another part to this, which is the public key. So all the keys that are in certificates are something called asymmetric keys. There's a private half and a public half. So now we need to get the public half that we can actually use for sharing out to the world. So with RSA, still pretty simple. You just multiply those two prime numbers together and you get a big number. And the whole security of RSA is based on the fact that it's really, really hard to go from that multiplied number back to one of those two prime numbers. And people have been trying to come up with easier ways to do this for thousands of years. It goes all the way back to Euclid and continued all the way up through the modern day of trying to find a, a good, easy way to reverse that RSA function that we rely on to keep our stuff secure. Uh, for elliptic curves, uh, we don't have anything in the private key to multiply, but we have a really big random number, and all you do is you take a point on that grid of dots and you start adding it to itself as many times as that, prime, that random number is. And the public key for an elliptic curve cert is just an XY coordinate on that graph. So now that we have our keys, we're gonna bind it to the ID using something called a CSR. So in order to get the request to the certificate authority to sign, we need to create this thing called a certificate signing request. And it's just a document that has an ID, it's got the key, and it can have some, some usage request in it. So the CA doesn't have to abide by these requests because, like I said, it's got a very specific step, set of steps that it has to follow, a really strict rubric that it has to maintain. So it can only include things that fall in line with the profiles that it's set up on the CA side. The usage, it's uh, anything that is any type of special privilege or, or a use for the key. So things like encrypting, signing, creating digital signatures, uh, being used for TLS or for authentication to a system, things like that. <clears throat> so the last part of the CA, uh, the CSR is a temporary binding. So this isn't a trusted binding, but it is cryptographically strong and it just shows that the machine that generated the private key is the the one that created the CSR. Now, now it's ready. You can send it to the certificate authority. And this is where uh, the certificate authority takes over and tries to send it off and create the, the certificate for it. And to quote Skywalker, this is where the fun begins. Before the CA signs the cert, it has to create what is known as a TBS certificate. And that stands for to be signed. So it's a template that the certificate authority fills out in order to get all the information that it needs to have in the final certificate in order for it to be useful and trusted for everybody outside. So it looks at what's in the CSR, vets it, and if it matches all the verification rules, it'll copy it over into the TBS certificate. So the first thing the CA needs to do is see if it's even allowed to issue a binding for this particular ID. So what it does is it'll reach out in the DNS 
and use something called a CAA record or Certificate Authority Authorization record. If you want to hear more about that, you can go to Paul's talk later today and he'll talk all about it. Two o'clock. Right there at two o'clock. So with CAA, uh, you just check the DNS to see if the CA is allowed to issue. It looks at the special DNS record, sees if the certificate authority's name is in there. If it is, that CA can issue the cert. If it's not, the CA is not allowed to issue the cert and has to stop right there. If it didn't find anything in the DNS, that's basically implicit permission to go ahead and sign it. And what if it ignores the CAA record? If it ignores the CAA record and it doesn't follow what it says and maybe it says somebody else's name in there, then the CAA can get in really big trouble and get pulled out of all those root stores. And then all the certificates that were signed by it aren't trusted anymore. And that's bad because it breaks things. <laughs> so the, the requirement for website certs for CAA has been in place for a couple years. But in March of next year, it's going in to be in place for email certificates as well. So if you're issuing email certs in the public internet, CAA records can help prevent other certificate authorities that you're not expecting from issuing certs for your domain. So the next thing is arguably one of the more important things here. The CA has to check the ID that it's going to bind in the certificate. So to do that, um, it has to see if the person or machine that's requesting the certificate is authorized to get a certificate for that identity. So one of the ways to do that, uh, especially for email certificates, is to send a code to an email. And if the person has control over that email address, they can get the special code, hand it back to the certificate authority, and it'll verify that that person has control over the email, which proves that it can have the cert for that email address. For website certs, you have to prove ownership of whatever domain names that you put into the CSR. And there's only a couple of ways to do this. One of them is, just like for email accounts, you can send a special code to one of the emails that is considered authoritative for the domain. So if you have a domain like mine, cem.me, they would send an email to administrator or hostmaster or postmaster, things like that. And if you can get an email, sent to you for those email addresses on a particular domain, you can get a certificate for that domain. <coughs> so the CAA checks the email. It could also check a website URL. So you can also, instead of getting the code in email and reflecting that back to the CA, you can get the special code and just put it up onto a URL that the CA will then go and check and see if the secret code is there. And if you can, that'll prove ownership over that domain. Another way to do it is to put that code into a DNS record. And so the CO then can go out and check the DNS to see if the code's there and see if you can, if you're authoritative to be able to issue a cert for that domain. <coughs> so once the ID is verified, the CAs will sometimes adjust that ID and add things like a, a state or an organization name, sometimes a, a physical address like a mailing address. And once they've verified all that, they will copy it over from the CSR into the TBS certificate. So the main name goes up on the top and any additional names go uh, down into the, the bottom into an extension. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. So. Not only does the CA need to verify the identity, it also needs to verify the next part, the key. It has to make sure that the key's algorithm and key strength is safe enough and strong enough for use on the internet. So, for example, you can have a 4096-bit RSA key, which is really strong, but you can't have a 1024-bit RSA key. You can use one of the elliptic curves that NIST has defined, P256, but you can't use one of the newer, arguably more secure curves, X25519. Once the CA is checked if the key is uh, strong enough and, and meets all the requirements, it also has to check 
if the key has already been known to be compromised. So that's another reach out that the CA has to do. It will go and check out a list of all the known keys that have been compromised, at least the ones that have been reported to that certificate authority. So it has to maintain a database of anything that it's ever been notified of that's compromised, anything that it's marked as revoked. Beyond that, so that's actually per CA for, for this one. The CA is only responsible for checking the certs that it particularly knows that's compromised. So there's, at least not yet, there's nothing that uh, you can go and query somebody else's certificate authority to see if you've got one of their compromised keys. However, there was a vulnerability back in 2008 in Debian that the random number generator was really, really good at creating really, really weak keys. And those keys proliferated all over the internet. And the, the operating system that had that weak random number generator kept getting included into appliances, both virtual and physical appliances, that companies would run on the edge of their network so that they were exposed to the public internet. And it used all of those weak keys. And unfortunately, even a month or two ago, somebody released some research where they found a whole other slew of these keys being used in production live signing email. So all of that was being used for DMARC. Now, typically, DMARC keys, uh, it's an email security standard. They don't relate to certificates, so none of the certificate authorities caught this. But out there on the public internet, signing email, we have all these weak keys that have been generated by this random number generator from 2008. Well, the vulnerability was made known in 08. So CIs have to do their part to make sure they're trying to keep weak keys off the internet. And for server certs, the certificate authority is not allowed to generate the private key. So one of the other checks it has to do is to make sure that it has never generated the private key that's associated to the public key in the CSR. So it has to go and call out to another list where it's got a list of all the private keys it's generated. You can ask the CA to generate a private key for an email cert, at least for now, and download the whole package with the private key and the certificate itself into your email client, but not so with web certs. So CA has to check all that. If it doesn't find the private key into the database, then it's done checking the keys, and it can take that key from the CSR and slide it over into the TBS certificate. Next up is the usage from the CSR. So this is probably the, uh, the thing that needs the least amount of checks because it really depends on what profile the requester asks the CA to put the cert under. Is it a web cert? Is it an email cert? Is it a code signing cert? The CA takes whatever usage the cert's intended for and copies that over into the usage part of the to be signed certificate. There's a couple fields here in the certificate that really remain the same for pretty much every certificate, or at least every certificate that's issued by a particular CA. So one of those is the version number. So this is the version of the certificate standard. It's been number three for a really long time, 20, 30 years. The issuer is just the certificate authority's name, the name of the, the actual CA that's issuing this certificate. The algorithm that the certificate authority is going to sign this certificate with, things like RSA with SHA-256 or ECDSA with SHA-256, it will put that up here so that uh, the clients know what to expect whenever they're validating the signature later on. The next step is the serial number. So each certificate has an individually printed serial number on it that has to be unique for a given CA. So two different CAs theoretically could issue the same serial number, but it's a requirement that the CA check that any certificates that it issues have unique serial numbers. And that's important because a serial number is used to revoke the certificate. So if you have two certs that have the same serial, you revoke one, it ends up revoking both of them. 
There's a couple other requirements in here. The serial number has to have at least 64 bits of randomness in it. A couple CAs have gotten in trouble by having like 63 bits of randomness, and then they have to go and revoke all the certs that didn't meet those requirements. So after the lookup, to make sure that the serial number is unique, the CA will put the serial number into that framework for the TBS certificate. Next up is the validity period. So each certificate has a start date, an end date. The start date is required to be within 48 hours of the actual signing of the key. So normally CAs will put that to the closest midnight. Whatever midnight GMT, whatever's closest, they'll just toss the, the start date of the cert there. Some other certificate authorities will just put it as the, the current now timestamp. It just depends on what software you're using for the CA and what you've configured on it. But we do a 48 hour clock skew, uh, or 48 hour allowance on either side of the actual signing date in order to allow certificates to potentially backdate or forward date slightly that CSR, or the, the final certificate, so that if you have a computer that's got a slow clock or if you've got a computer with a fast clock, whenever you deploy that cert out, hopefully using automation, any clients that hit it right after it gets deployed I won't have a problem validating it because if a client hits a cert and it says, oh yeah, I'm not good until tomorrow, then you can't trust it and it's going to break that client's connection. So if you know that you have a bunch of clients that possibly could have some clock skew, you can adjust your uh, start date that way. <clears throat> now, the end date is right now restricted to a maximum of 398 days. So that's about a year and three months. And mostly that's just for kind of legacy reasons where CAs would give people three months ahead of time to go and try to renew their certificate so they could get a year out of use out of it. But some CAs will issue certs down to seven or 10, uh, up to 90 days. But they could also issue it for any number of days in between as long as it doesn't go past that 398. So after that, the CA starts to populate all the rest of the fields here. It adds information on where to find the CA certificate. So sometimes browsers, if the server is misconfigured, the browser can call out and grab the CA signing certificate to see if it's one that should be trusted. It takes some extra round hops. It's not very efficient, but it's one thing that the browsers did to help server operators stop shooting themselves in the foot and breaking clients. It'll also add uh, revocation information. So this is how to tell if the cert's revoked. Usually this is a URL that, the again, the web client can hit and say, is this cert one of the revoked ones, or is it good? Can I keep going? Uh, it'll also have a place in there for policy information. This, so this is where the CA says, I issued this cert in accordance with this policy. And it's got another URL that'll go out to the certificate authority where it's listed what policy the cert was issued under. Now, most of that stuff was relatively the same for every certificate that the, the CA has issued, uh, at least for a given certificate authority under a specific profile. But we have one more in here. This is the newest uh, extension that CAs are issuing with. It's called the cert Signed Certificate Timestamp List. And sometimes it's referred to just kind of as a concept in whole as Certificate Transparency, or CT. So CT was started as a concept by some Google researchers back in 2011 through 2012. They released a paper on it to say, hey, we have this great idea. It was in response to a certificate authority breach where an attacker got into a certificate authority and started issuing certificates for Google.com and nobody knew about it until somebody posted on a forum, hey, I was looking at my cert because I like to look at certs and I saw that this was issued by this weird certificate authority in the Netherlands. What's up, Google? And Google was like, um, that shouldn't be happening. We need to find a way to stop this or at least know about it in the future. So they've been running with Chrome uh, 
for about a decade now, the certificate transparency was codified as an internet draft standard back in 2013. In 2015, Chrome started mandating that some certificate authorities used it because they were maybe misbehaving a little bit and issuing things that they shouldn't. So Chrome wanted to make sure that they knew what was going on. They added some more certs in mid-2016, and then by 2018, Chrome started mandating that every public certificate for web included this certificate transparency extension. But this extension that goes into the certificate, it's only a really small piece of the entire certificate transparency ecosystem. Overall, certificate transparency is just the idea that every cert has to be logged into a public distributed database, multiple public databases that hopefully are managed by different groups of people in order to help prevent collusion and to, to maintain the integrity of this distributed database. The databases are made of special structures that are append only, they're signed, and they include a timestamp in every entry that shows exactly when that certificate was logged. So these blocks, whenever you add it, uh, the certificate will hash, will get hashed. That hash gets added up to the tree head, and then the tree gets signed up at the top of the head. So it's basically an aggregate of hashes that go up into the top of this certificate transparency tree. So whenever you add another certificate, it becomes another leaf into this tree. Those two leaves are hashed together, and then that hash is hashed into the head, and it's signed again. If you need to add another certificate, or you, you've run out of room on this node, because you can, you can only have two nodes per, or two leaves per node. So you just create another node there to add a certificate to. Everything hashes up, and then the sign tree head gets moved up to the top of the tree structure. <laughs> so if the if the node isn't if the node that's getting a certificate added to it isn't at the top of the tree structure, uh, you just simply add another one and then this tree starts building out. It grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Lots and lots of cryptographic operations that are necessary for all of this to take place. Hashing for every leaf, every node, up, the root, up to the root, and then assigning operation to cap it all off to make sure that everything is trusted. But if you have a lot of certificate authorities submitting to a log or a group of logs, that can be a lot of cryptographic operations and you can start getting a backlog of things that you need to add to the queue. So to help with this, the, the logs came up with something known as a maximum merge delay. So that's the amount of time that the log has to include everything in its backlog into this tree structure to make sure that everything is included and that it gets all of the hashes and signatures done in a specific amount of time. The problem is the maximum merge delay is usually a lot longer than a certificate authority is willing to wait. Because if I've automated my certificate issuance and I'm trying to get a cert from a certificate authority, I want that as fast as possible. And the CAA has already got a whole bunch of other steps that it has to do. So we wanted the logs to be as fast as possible as well. So there's a concept to solve this called a signed certificate timestamp. And it's basically a receipt from the log saying, I've got it, I promise I'm gonna include this in the log. It'll be within the maximum merge delay, but in the meanwhile, here's a receipt that you can take back to the certificate authority and it's tantamount to a promise to include the certificate in the logs at a later date before the maximum merge delay. <laughs> So there's lots of groups that have a vested interest in making sure that all these certs are logged, uh, but browsers 
have been the ones been pushing the most for it and, and really have the most sway because they have a say in what certificate authorities get included into the trust store. So they've been the ones pushing for this. And like I said, from 2018, all of the public certs have had this in it. Since then, software has been catching up and you can see the uh, decoded SCTs now and, and things like Windows. And I think Mac OS also has a, a decoder that shows a little bit prettier uh, version of what's inside. All that's in that SCT is the log ID, the timestamp, and a signature. And before, oops. So before uh, they added this into the browsers for the certificate viewer, all you saw was a whole bunch of hex numbers that didn't make any sense to most people. So <clears throat> CT gets sent off to the CA, but in order to sign the certificate, the CA has to have that SCT embedded into the certificate. But it can't get the SCT until it logs the certificate. And it can't log the certificate until the cert's signed and it has an SCT, but it can't get the... So there's a catch-22, there's a cycle here that we, we have to find a way to break. So the solution for that is to create a construct known as a pre-certificate. A pre-certificate is exactly the same as the final certificate for every single field except for the certificate transparency extension. And in that, they put basically a, a, they call it a poison extension. It's something that says this certificate cannot be used for anything else other than for logging a certificate to a certificate transparency log. So you can't use it for creating a, a trusted site for a browser. You can't use it for signing email. This is only good for logging. And the reason is, the reason for the poison extension in there is the signature that goes on the bottom of the cert is signed with the same private key that will eventually sign that final certificate. So back to the high level overview, we've got the CA sends the pre-certificate over to the cert transparency logs. The cert transparency logs send back an SCT and the CA can embed that into the extension. But what happens if the private key for that log gets compromised? The browsers have to untrust that log. And they're relying on the logs to be trusted so that they can validate the cert. So if we untrust a log, every certificate with one of those SCTs in it is now untrusted because the SCT is no longer trusted. If I've got the private key for a log, I can start signing SCTs at will. I don't even have to abide by the current timestamp. I could backdate every single timestamp and make it look like I've logged the cert so that the browsers and the website operators, everybody that's looking over at this transparency ecosystem that's reading these public databases, they wouldn't know looking at a particular cert that it was not trusted. And so it's effectively gone back to the same problem that Google was trying to solve originally. I can now issue certs that aren't really logged, but it looks like they are. So how do we solve that? Well, simply we just add more logs. So the CA then, instead of just going to one log, it'll go to two or three. It just depends on the time that the certificate's valid for. So if you have a cert that's valid for six months, you only need two SCTs. If you've got a cert that's valid for an entire year, you'll need three. So here from the beginning, I send the CSR to the certificate authority. The CA checks in DNS if it can issue the cert. It goes back and checks in either DNS or email or on the website if I'm allowed to have that cert. It'll go and check the key that I requested to be in the certificate to see if it's valid, to see if it's uh, a good key or if it's compromised. It'll see if the CA has ever issued that key and created the private key for that public key that's in the CSR. It'll create a serial number. And it'll go and check its list of serial numbers to see if it's ever issued that serial number before. And then it'll create a pre-certificate, sign it, and send it off to multiple logs 
getting back multiple SCTs, embed all of those into the final certificate, the final TBS certificate, and then finally, it'll hash that TBS certificate structure, send that hash to the CA's private key, the CA will sign the private key, or sign the hash with its private key, and then you have a certificate. Thank you. We do have, I think, about five minutes for questions, so if anybody's got those. Yes, sir. For the compliance? Okay. So the question is, what standards does the certificate authorities have to abide by? Who enforces it? Where does all of that come from? So there's a thing called the Certificate Authority Browser Forum, and it's a group of people that issue certs and people that look at certs and see if they're trustworthy. That body agrees on the set of rules that they want to publish, but it's ultimately up to the individual trust store operators to have specific rules for the certificates that are included in their trust store. So Microsoft's got a whole group of people that work on what trusted means for Microsoft. Mozilla's got a very open community with different people in it that make the rules specifically for Mozilla. Chrome's got a similar thing. Apple's got a similar thing. Uh, there's other trust store operators that kind of abdicate a lot of that responsibility to Mozilla because it's really the most open. They have public forum, public discussion. Microsoft's basically the opposite of that. They're very closed. You hardly ever hear from them. But it's that group. The cabrowserforum.org is the website. They have a set of baseline requirements. And that's what most of the certificates uh, are issued off of, profiles in there. So the question was about how to know if a certificate transparency log private key is compromised. So one of the ways to do that is if somebody publishes on GitHub, that's probably the easiest. Uh, another way is if somebody finds a certificate that has an SCT in it that's not in the log that it says it's from. So that could happen multiple ways. It could have gotten into the queue after it had gotten the SCT issued, so gotten into the inclusion queue. Supposed to have been logged, but the server rebooted and lost all its memory, and so it never got logged. It could also be that the private key is compromised. But it doesn't really matter which scenario that is, because both of those scenarios are grounds for removal of that log from the trust store, and from the trusted set of logs that the browser has. So. It's less important if the private key is compromised or if the log is just misbehaving or had a really, really bad day, which several logs have had. So whenever that happens, you look at the, the certificate, and as long as there's still one of those SCTs that is trusted, the browser can still trust the certificate. That's why they include three of them. So at least one of them has to be trusted whenever they're evaluating the trust. But there have been occasions where all of the SCTs that are in a CERT have gotten untrusted. And when that happens, the CERT is untrusted, and the CA has to notify everybody that's got a certificate there and get them to reissue the CERT and reapply it to their website. Any more? All right, well, I thank you for uh, coming to B-Sides, and thanks for attending the talk. Appreciate it.